Hey, Hope Markham, thank you for once again inviting us into your home so that we can worship God at a distance from separate spaces. And I'd like to say happy Father's Day to all the dads who are watching. Uh, we love you and we are praying for you and we hope that you're able to enjoy um, a good time with your family this weekend. And we know that for many, uh, Father's Day, though it can be uh, a happy time and an enjoyable time for others, it's, um, it's a sorrowful time and it's a hard time. And the idea of dad is a hard idea to bring up. And to those who are like that in our church, um, I would want to pray for you and encourage you to look to God in heaven as the true father uh, that he is to his own son, Jesus. And when we see the father uh, demonstrate the love that he has and the kindness that he has for his own son, Jesus, we can have the confidence that uh, that same God can be a father to us that we can trust as well. And I do hope and pray that Hope Markham is a home and a family where you feel belong, where you belong, and where you trust as well. So on this Father's Day, for all of us, I want to take a moment and pray. Lord, thank you that you are Father. As the scripture says, Father to the fatherless, and defender of the widow. And you discipline the one who you love. And you give good gifts. And you see us and comfort us in our pain. Lord, I thank you for all of those who have um, given their time to be spiritual fathers to those who lack um, their biological dad being around. I thank you for all of those who are striving to be godly fathers. And for all of us, uh, would we, Lord, uh, be men after your own heart who do your will after the heart of Jesus Christ, would we be men who are planted by streams of water, who bear fruit in season, whose leaf does not wither, and who everything we do, we prospers? Would we be men of grace and of mercy, of love and of gentleness? And would Hope Markham be a home to all in Christ? Thank you, Lord, for your love for us. We honor you as our Father. In Jesus' name, amen. I'd invite you to have your Bible open together with me uh, to Acts chapter 8. Today we're going to consider verse 1 to verse 40. No one expected 2020 to be what it has been. Uh, but here we stand, nearly halfway through it, believe it or not. And a lot of us are kind of just waiting for 2021. <laughs> Life is full of a lot of unexpected obstacles. A lot. Today, Acts chapter 8, verse 1 to verse 40, is going to show us that unexpected obstacles can be gospel opportunities if we make the most of them. We've come to a point in the book of Acts in chapter 8 where uh, Christians are being killed and Christians are being jailed in the city of Jerusalem for their faith. And now this grassroots movement of followers of Jesus, who are finally becoming the people of God that God created his chosen people to be, people from every tribe and every tongue, a people that grew from 120 to several thousand, has now been scattered out of Jerusalem because of this persecution. But this persecution that was threatening their very lives, didn't scatter them in fear to, to hide or to cower, but it sent them out in courage to speak the gospel with boldness. Even persecution was not an obstacle, but it became an opportunity. When you think of the events that are happening right now in 2020, do you see obstacles or do you see opportunities? The mission of Christ is not in a holding pattern, even though it might feel like life is. A global pandemic is forcing us to be distanced from each other. Social unrest is causing many people to be on edge. Life is full of unexpected obstacles, but our mission and our calling to be spirit-empowered witnesses for Jesus Christ, bold witnesses, and merciful neighbors who share the gospel courageously, clearly, gently, and respectfully, that's still the same. 
Acts chapter 8 is going to show us three opportunities. Three opportunities that arose for these Christians and one man in particular, Philip, together with the apostles, who approached what could have been an obstacle in persecution and in faith and obedience, led by the Spirit, saw three gospel opportunities. We see the first opportunity in verse 4 to verse 8. Now those who were scattered went about preaching the word. Philip went down to the city of Samaria and proclaimed to them the Christ. And the crowds with one accord paid attention to what was being said by Philip when they heard him and saw the signs that he did. For unclean spirits, crying out with a loud voice, came out of many who had them, and many who were paralyzed or lame were healed. So so there was much joy in that city. In Philip's courage to go to the city of Samaria to preach the gospel, we see opportunity for unity. Not just any type of unity, but a rare unity. A unity at the time that might have even seemed unimaginable. Do you remember what the sons of Jacob, what they did to be able to convince their father that the favorite son Joseph had seemingly died? Joseph didn't die. The son sold him off into slavery. But to convince Jacob that Joseph was dead, the other 11 sons of Jacob took Joseph's special robe, dipped it in blood, and with malice and hate in their heart, ripped and tore it to pieces to try and convince their father that Joseph was gone and he was never coming back. Samaria and the Samaritans had a shredded and torn relationship with their own brothers the Jews. The relationship between these two ethnic groups, the Samaritans and the Jews, had been torn to pieces by the malice and hatred they had to each other over centuries of time. Samaritans and Jews were once brothers, same nation, same kingdom, same heritage. But Israel split into two kingdoms. The northern kingdom, Samaria, chose to set up a new temple in opposition to the southern kingdom, Judah. The northern kingdom also uh, chose to intermarry with um, people from different ethnic backgrounds, with foreigners. And for both of these reasons, the southern Jews despised and hated the Samaritans. So much so that some of the rabbis of the time said such racist things like, let no man eat the bread of the Samaritans, for whoever eats their bread is he who eats pig's flesh. This is what the Jewish convert, Philip, arrives into when he arrives into Samaria. Philip himself isn't a Jew by birth, he's a Greek. He converts to Judaism, but after the events of Pentecost, he then is baptized and becomes a follower of Jesus. And after the persecution happens, he goes about into Samaria as one who has a Jewish foundational religion but is now a new follower of Jesus. He begins preaching the message of Christ. Filled with the Holy Spirit, he preaches good news and performs miracles of Jesus to those who are despised and hated by the Jews. The same people who are threatening even to kill him. Philip preached that Jesus is is the one Messiah and the one king that Jews and Samaritans alike were both looking for. And then he performed miracles like Jesus. And these were similar to the miracles that we saw Jesus himself perform. And when Jesus performed these miracles, he said that if he casts out demons by the Spirit of Christ, then the kingdom has come upon you. So his miracles affirm the message of the good news of the kingdom. And in response to this, the Samaritans, these people who are despised and rejected and hated as unclean, they believe. They believe and they're baptized in the name of Jesus, just like Philip the Greek is, just like the Jews are as well. 
But we begin to see that though they believed and been baptized, the Holy Spirit had not yet fallen upon them. They actually waited for the leaders of the grassroots movement, Peter and John, to come and to confirm that these people who you thought should be hated, these people are actually accepted as equals. Look at the text, verse 14. Now when the apostles at Jerusalem had seen that Samaria had received the word of God, they sent to them Peter and John, who came down and prayed for them that they may receive the Holy Spirit. For he had not fallen on any of them, They had only been baptized in the name of Jesus. Then they laid their hands on them, and they received the Holy Spirit. After centuries of Jews calling Samaritans unclean, these Jews of the new movement of the people of God following the way of Jesus come to the Samaritans, who are supposed to be unclean, and lay their hands on the Samaritans, And in doing so, the Holy Spirit comes into the Samaritans, verifying in Jesus' name that these people who for centuries were called unclean and neglected now share in the same life of God that all other followers of Jesus now share in. And what could not be accomplished through political and military campaigning for hundreds of years, was finally initiated in a single day through the preaching of the gospel. What could have been an obstacle, centuries of racial hatred, became an opportunity when a man filled with the Spirit opened his mouth and boldly proclaimed the name of Jesus. At the end of the sermon, I'm going to suggest ways that I believe we can learn, like Philip, to make the most of the opportunity, of the what might seem like obstacles in 2020, and how in Christ they can be opportunities for the gospel. But before that, I want to show the two other opportunities that we come across. You see, there was one Samaritan who made the most of this opportunity, but for personal, selfish gain. And time eventually showed the real truth of what was in his heart. The first opportunity of the gospel is one of unity. The second opportunity of the gospel is one for truth. Look at verse 9. It says, But there was a man named Simon who had previously practiced magic in the city and amazed the people of Samaria, saying that he was someone great. They all paid attention to him from the least to the greatest, saying, This man is the power of God that is called great. They paid attention to him because for a long time he had amazed them with his magic. But when they believed Philip as he preached good news about the kingdom of God in the name of Jesus Christ, they were baptized, both men and women. Even Simon himself believed. And after being baptized, he continued with Philip. And seeing great signs and miracles performed, he was amazed. And when the apostles of Jerusalem heard that Samaria had received the word of God, they sent to them Peter and John, who came down and prayed that they might receive the Holy Spirit. For he had not yet fallen on them, but he had only been baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. Then they laid their hands on them, and they received the gift of the Spirit. Now, when Simon saw that the Spirit was given through the laying on of the apostles' hands, he offered them money, saying, Give me this power also, so that anyone on whom I lay my hands may receive the Spirit. This became an opportunity for truth. A name is a reputation whether it's in comic books or real life, some names just scream villain, right? You know this when you hear when you hear names like Lex Luthor, like Thanos from comic books, or it from real life, names like names like Osama bin Laden or Adolf Hitler. Now, the name Simon the Magician might be uh, a new name for modern ears, but for the first Christians who read the first book of Acts, they knew exactly who Simon was. And when they heard the name Simon, it screamed out, villain. There was an early church historian whose name was Irenaeus. He was a theologian from northern Africa. And Irenaeus wrote that this man, Simon the Magician, could have been the founder of the first earliest false teaching that saturated through a lot of the church called Gnosticism. 
Acts 4 is the origin story of one of the most notorious villains of the early church. And yes, Luke does say that Simon believed. And he says that Simon was baptized. And Irenaeus even says that for most of his life, Simon identified himself as a Christian. But Luke, in giving this origin story for this notorious villain, gives clear reasons that demonstrate that his faith was a fraud from the beginning. So it's an opportunity for us for truth to be able to see his hypocrisy, to see what false conversion actually looks like, and actually to look into my heart and say, ask, why and what? Why do, why do I want to come to Christ? And what do I want from Christ? See, I'm a fraud because he is clearly motivated by self-interest. All he wants is power. He practiced occultic magic practices to be able to convince people that he was someone great. Uh, and people thought he was great. But evidently, he wasn't even a true believer in his own practice. Because when he saw Philip and the power of the Holy Spirit performing signs and miracles that were greater than his, he immediately abandoned every, all of his occultic practices so that he could try and have this other one. And then, when he saw that the apostles had the unique and exclusive um, power by the Holy Spirit to verify that the uh, Samaritans were true believers and lay hands on them to receive the Holy Spirit, Phil, uh, excuse me, Simon then wanted that power. Notice that he didn't actually want the Holy Spirit. He only wanted the power to give other people the Holy Spirit. He's a fraud. He was only around to bask in the glow and get his own power. The second reason that he's a fraud is because his repentance is empty. Peter calls him out hard. Verse 20, he says, May your silver perish with you. Wow. Because you thought you could obtain the gift of God with money. You have neither part nor lot in this matter, for your heart is not right before God. Repent, therefore, of this wickedness of yours, and pray to the Lord that, if possible, the intent of your heart may be forgiven. For I see that you are in the gall of bitterness and the bond of iniquity. He's a fraud. And then he kind of like has some kind of act of contrition, but it's fake. Peter says, you are saturated with bitter jealousy because you want this power and you're shackled in your sin and still a slave to it. And Peter gives an opportunity for him to receive God's grace. Peter gives an opportunity for him to receive forgiveness. Peter says, pray to the Lord that you might be forgiven. And then this fraud says, pray for me to the Lord. He's not even willing to own his own sin and pray to God. He wants someone else to do it for him. The true reality of Simon's hypocrisy was exposed. This was an opportunity for truth. And seeing the origin story of this notorious villain, it's opportunity to look at our heart and ask, what do I want when I come to Christ? You know, in normal times, many people feel either angry or apathetic towards politics. Most people. Because often they don't get what they want out of what politicians say they can give. And when they don't get what they want, they get angry. And they write nasty emails, and they post videos online, and they use bad words. Or they just get apathetic because they see the bureaucratic process and that apparently politicians don't keep their word, and they, they, they don't give me what they say they can, so they just don't care, and they're apathetic. Honestly, people can feel the same way about religion. People that can same, feel the same way about Jesus. Because they want something from God and expect something from God that God has never actually promised that he will give. And something that doesn't describe the relationship that God wants to have with us. I've seen this in people who come to our church. And maybe this is you. A crisis happens. 
and they're looking for some kind of help. And in a crisis, many people turn to many things, and faith is just one of the many attractions that you can see at the carnival of crisis. They're financially tight and want God to bless them. They, they're in relational strife and they want peace. They're depressed and they want to be happy. They're afraid and they want hope. Be sure, God can comfort us in these ways. But I've seen many people come to God for the gifts of God and not to actually know and love and walk with the giver of those gifts themselves. So when they don't get what they expect from God, they get apathetic and they move on to the next thing. They get angry and they get mad at religion and they move on to the next attraction at the crisis carnival. Simon wanted power. Do you find yourself apathetic or angry towards God? Are you expecting something from God that he, Apparently, you haven't seen yet, and now indifferently turning away or angrily yelling out. Beware of your own heart. If you want the gifts that come from God rather than the life that you can know the giver himself, the true nature of your faith may soon be exposed. But this doesn't have to be your story. Because while we see in Simon a picture of a false conversion, and fraudulent faith, the next picture that we see of the next person that Philip meets is a picture of true conversion, sincere faith, earnest faith. After Philip is in Samaria, the Holy Spirit then directs Philip to another man, another man who has been searching for his soul to be satisfied but he's been unable to find what he longs for. And when Philip met this man, a man from Ethiopia, it became another opportunity for the gospel. We've seen an opportunity for unity, an opportunity for truth, and here we see an opportunity for joy. And we as followers of Jesus can also see these opportunities, not just obstacles, if we make the most of them. Look at verse 26. It says, Now an angel of the Lord appeared to, uh, said to Philip, Rise and go towards the south to the road that goes down from Jerusalem to Gaza. This is a desert place. And he rose and went. And there was an Ethiopian, a eunuch, a court official of Candace, the queen of the Ethiopians, who was in charge of all her treasure. He had come to Jerusalem to worship and was returning, seated in his chariot, and he was reading the prophet Isaiah. So a little history lesson, all right? This was really interesting for me to learn, and I hope it will be for you too. And it helps us to be able to see the real reason that allows this to be an opportunity for joy. Ancient Ethiopia was a prosperous African kingdom built on the Nile River. Candace, the name apparently given to the queen of Ethiopia, isn't a name at all. Candace is a really poor translation of an African royal title, Kankade. And Kankade was a term attributed to the queen of Ethiopian kingdom, which means queen mother or royal woman. Like the Egyptian kingdom, the Ethiopian kingdom treated their kings as divine figures. As a godlike symbolic figure, though, the Ethiopian kings were too venerated and too special and too, like, ivory tower are way up there to actually get involved in the, the day-to-day life of governing the, the kingdom. So who did it? The Kankade did it. The queens in um, Ethiopia were the ones with real political power, with real political authority, and some of the Kankade were actually warrior queens who led their armies into battle. The Ethian eunuch likely served under Kankade Amantateri, and she ruled in Ethiopia from the year 25 to 41 of the Common Era. Unlike Simon the Magician, this man, the Ethiopian eunuch, had real power. He was the personal accountant to the queen of the Ethiopian kingdom. He was responsible for her personal finances. Also unlike Simon, 
But this man wasn't just searching for power. He had it, but his soul was searching for something more. Evidently, his heart felt uneasy in his homeland, and worshiping the king of Ethiopia did not feel the gaping hole in his soul that he was looking for. And somehow he found about the one true living God, Yahweh, who was worshipped in Israel. So at least once a year, he would leave his familiar home in the capital of Ethiopia and travel to a foreign land seeking God in the capital of Israel. But whenever he arrived to worship, as a foreign eunuch, the Jewish law forbid him from having full access into the temple. He was only allowed into the outer courts. He couldn't come into the inner courts. He knew this, but still, knowing this, that leaving his homeland where he was familiar and going to a different land that was foreign, a 2,500-kilometer trek, he still made the trek because his heart was still searching. And even after he made it to the festival and, and then was returning home after worshiping, he was still searching. He was still reading. His soul was still longing. And this is where Philip arrives. The festival was over, but he was still searching through the scriptures. And Philip comes up to him by direction of the Holy Spirit and says, do you understand what you were reading? And this man of power and nobility says, how can I unless someone guides me? And he invited Philip to come up and sit with him. Now the passage of scripture he was reading was this. This is from Isaiah 53, verse 6 to verse 8. Like a sheep, he was led to the slaughter, and like a lamb before its shearers is silent, so he opens not his mouth. In his humiliation, justice was denied him. Who can describe this generation? For his life is taken away from the earth. And the eunuch said to Philip, About whom, I ask you, does the prophet say this? About himself or about someone else? Then Philip opened his mouth, and beginning with the scriptures, he told him the good news about Jesus. And as they were going along the road, they came to some water. And the eunuch said, See, here is water. What prevents me from being baptized? And he commanded the chariot to stop. And they both went down in the water, Philip and the eunuch, and he baptized him. And when they came up out of the water, the Spirit of the Lord carried Philip away. And the eunuch saw him no more and went on his way rejoicing. He found what his soul was looking for when this witness, Philip, entered into his life and pointed him to the destination that he didn't know he was searching for, to the way, the truth, and the life, Jesus Christ. And see, here's why this is so joyful for the eunuch. See, he read here from Isaiah 53, but only a short while later in the writings of the prophet Isaiah, he would have come across Isaiah 56 which would have given a specific promise that would have given a unique joy for this foreign eunuch. Isaiah 56, starting at verse 4, says, For thus says the Lord, To the eunuchs who keep my Sabbaths and who choose the things that please me and hold fast my covenant, I will give in my house and within my walls a monument and a name that is better than sons of and daughters. I will give them an everlasting name that shall be not cut off. These I will bring into my holy mountain and make them joyful in my house of prayer. See, see, the law forbid him from full access into the temple, but the prophet Isaiah spoke of a day when that suffering servant came where he would have full access into the temple, full access where he would be treated as an equal and son and daughter to all other people who are native born of Israel. And he will have full access in the temple, full access where he will get a joy with the people of God, worshiping in the presence of God. He said, I will make you joyful in the house of prayer. And here, on the road in a desert place, he finds that joy because he finds the witness of Christ through a faithful servant, Philip. And the reason that he's able to have this joy The reason that he's able to have this full acceptance is because he recognizes that Jesus is the Messiah who suffered his full rejection. It was the rejection of Christ on the cross as the suffering servant that allowed this man to have full acceptance 
as an equal in Christ. And it's the same for all of us today. It's the same for a Jew like Peter and John. It's the same for a Greek like Philip. It's the same for a Samaritan. It's the same for an Ethiopian eunuch. All of our decisions to turn away from God are called sin. And by turning from God, we have rejected God and we do not deserve to have access into the presence of God. But Jesus suffered the rejection that we deserve when he was brutally killed on the cross. And in Christ, because he is the perfect son of God, by faith in him, we are fully accepted as children of God. The gospel ratifies the true value and full equality that we all have in the eyes of God to join together in what gives humanity its greatest joy, sharing in the presence of the Spirit and worshiping in the presence of God in the name of Jesus. The pure joy that God offers is through the grace of Christ. There could have been a lot of obstacles because of persecution. Philip's life was being threatened, but that did not stop him. That sent him off with courage. Out of what could have been an obstacle, Philip and the apostles made the most of their time and it enabled gospel opportunities. 2020 is not the year that we expected it to be. But the mission is not in a holding pattern. We're still called to be witnesses for Jesus Christ. Let me ask you, York Region's moving into stage two and finally we're able to go out a little bit more and not have to be so isolated. But let me ask you, in your time of isolation, have you gone a step further and chosen insulation? Have you chosen to completely cut yourself off from the church? Have you chosen to completely shut yourself off from any interaction, digital even, from those who we could be witnesses to? I understand a global pandemic where we're told to distance ourselves from each other, this can be an obstacle to evangelism. But for those who are like Philip, who have his same allegiance and his same character, a pandemic doesn't need to be an obstacle. It can be an opportunity. The social unrest that we see in the news around us, it can be a... Um, it can be a time of social un, uh, uh, put. It can be a time that puts us all on edge, where we don't know how to be able to interact with each other because everyone is angry or feels insensitive or has strong opinions. But when we have the same allegiance and the same character as Philip had, even social unrest doesn't need to be an obstacle. It can be an opportunity. If you're going to make 2020. And if you're going to make the most out of 2020, then we need our lives to be held together with the same allegiance and the same character that Philip had. Um, this Sunday is the first day of summer. And the days and the seasons come and go because the earth rotates on its axis and is held in orbit around the sun. Like the earth orbits around the sun, Philip could turn obstacles into opportunities because his highest and greatest allegiance was to Christ and Christ's kingdom. And his whole life orbited around the glory of his identity as a citizen of the great kingdom of Christ. As sinners, though, we often act out of allegiance to other things. We act out of our allegiance to our political preference, out of, to our family heritage, to our personal aspirations, to our, to our family's needs. Each of these are unique ways that God has made us individuals. But each of these things must be secondary compared to our common and greater citizenship in the kingdom of God. Think about the way that you interact with others. Do your interactions with others validate that your highest allegiance is to Christ and to his kingdom, or is it to something else? Like the earth rotates on its own invisible axis that runs through its core, day by day, Philip's character was guided and directed by the invisible person of the Holy Spirit who lived in the core of his heart. 
as sinners, we often turn to the ruined way of human nature, which causes our lives to spin off access and out of control. But as saints, we can be filled with the Spirit as we set our minds on the Spirit to walk by the Spirit and be led by the Spirit as witnesses empowered by the Spirit for the gospel of Jesus Christ. Think about your innermost character, though. Can you say that the way that you live your life is rotating around the Spirit and His way or around your desires and your way? If the kingdom is not our highest allegiance that our life orbits around, and if the Spirit is not the axis by which our lives rotate around, then we ourselves can be obstacles to the gospel and miss opportunities for the gospel. But in humble submission to the Holy Spirit, in loving surrender to our King Jesus, we can be witnesses. And we can make the most out of 2020 to see gospel opportunities that create unity and that reveal truth and produce real joy. Father in heaven, thank you for the gospel of Jesus Christ. Thank you that the Spirit of Christ empowers us to be witnesses for Christ Jesus. Lord, when I think about 2020 and the life that we are living in, it is hard to see the flag of the kingdom waving around us. I see many other flags waving. It is hard to see the path of the Spirit that you want to lead us on because there are so many ways that it seems like the world is directing me to go. Father, these make life feel like we are hitting obstacles. But would you cause us to give our highest allegiance to Christ, to give all of our hearts to the Spirit? And in so, would you allow us to see these what might be obstacles like a global pandemic and social unrest as opportunities that glorify your name and do good for others. In Jesus' name, amen.